just a minute. I'm going to live stream this on YouTube and... <clears throat> All right. Um okay, inshallah we can start. So assalamu bismillah walhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome to Connect Institute's online event entitled A New Start, uh, where we talk about or we'll discuss about Quranic verses that speaks about repentance and personal growth. So we have our lecture for today's online event, which is Brother Wiley Ibrahim. But before we move forward to that, inshallah, I'd like to invite everyone to please do follow uh, Brother Wail Ibrahim, Sheikh Wail Ibrahim on his Instagram at Wail Ibrahim HK, on his Facebook Wail Ibrahim, and also on the Aware Academy's YouTube channel. Currently, he's doing his Roaming Ramadan series, which I invite you all to please do catch up on because they are very light, but of course, the lessons are immense. So, and also, please don't forget to follow Connect Institute Philippines on Instagram, Facebook, and Connect on YouTube as well. Well, we're trying to grow our YouTube channel. We have just uploaded some of our a uh, few of our lectures uh, from the previous conference that we had. So please do give us a subscription, inshallah, so that our YouTube channel can grow, and that way also you support our um, cause. Alhamdulillah. So. Of course, without further ado, I'd like to um, intru briefly introduce our speaker for this online event entitled "A New Start." Of course, I think he's not uh, <laughs> he's not new to all. Everybody knows him. He's uh, none other than uh, Sheikh Wail Ibrahim. He's a life coach, author, international speaker, and of course, the founder of Connect Institute Philippines, serving Islam Team Hong Kong, and the Aware Academy. Without further ado, Sheikh Wail Ibrahim. Already, <laughs> assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Uh, glad to be uh, around Connect Institute members and fans. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you all. Ramadan Mubarak to everyone, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from one and all. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. And uh, Ameen, ya for uh, arranging this. And uh, Mabrook, by the way, congratulations on your new initiative. Uh, <laughs> I, I urge everyone to look up also uh, by Aisha's new website and services. MashaAllah, it's getting uh, growing by Allah's so. uh, will. <laughs> Ameen. Ameen, inshallah. Barakallah. Ameen. Jazakallah. So people, oh, by the way, we have people I from forgot Colombia you. today. Oh, wow, mashallah, that's a, a good oh. colleague of mine, Sister Allison, all the way from Colombia. Jazakallah khairan, Sister Allison. By the way, I forgot to introduce myself. I am your host and at your service for this online event, Sister Bai Aisha. Again, I welcome you all to this online event, A New Start, where we discuss about verses from the Quran and uh, that speaks about repentance and personal growth. Uh, but Big Brother, this time around, right? Because we know that everybody's fasting. We don't want them to bore it with, uh, with a long lecture. lecture. Yeah, yes. so our approach will be a di little bit different. Inshallah, we want, it to be inter we want it to be interactive as well. So we will jump onto that. Any uh, Anyone here, inshallah, who has their Quran with them, perhaps can use your phone, your personal uh, Quran inshallah and I want you all to open your Quran and go to Surah Al-Baqarah Ayah 183 and please do raise your hand if you want to read this Ayah and then and if I could ask you know, all the participants on Zoom in particular if they could open their cameras if it is feasible yes. uh, so that we can you know you know interact with you properly more and more efficiently inshallah if you don't mind yep yes if everybody can please, uh, for those who can, inshallah, please do uh, try your best to open the camera so that our speaker, our teacher can see you, your beautiful faces. <laughs> and that gives us a boost as well to, you know, to do the lecture. So please do open up your camera if you can. So anybody here who's ready to get their, um, who's ready to read an ayah from the Quran, just raise your hand. Sister Zaina, are you ready to read the ayah that I just mentioned? 
to Sister Zaina all the way from Kuala Lumpur. So, Sister Zaina, do you want to read the ayah? Or Sister Fatima, perhaps. Okay, I'm just gonna mute. Okay, baby. They, can, <laughs> they can raise up their hands first if they wish, inshallah. Yeah, if you wish, you can raise up your hands so that we, we would know who wants to read an ayah from the Quran. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Are you guys asleep? Uh -huh. I think everybody's on their fasting mode and everybody's like, oh my God. A fasting mode start. should be like energetic, sister. <laughs> in an hour, we're going to break our fast. and uh, Somebody is driving. Brother Aisa is driving. So you see, oh. imagine if you are going to attend your class and you need to go to university or you need to go to a sheikh. Or, can you imagine coming with your car inside the classroom? Like you will kill everybody. So we advise <laughs> you to, brother, please be careful. Drive safe. And those who are at home, at the convenience, please turn on your cameras, if possible at all. But if you're yeah. napping, if you're wearing your pajama, if you don't want to put your hijab, uh, we understand. May Allah make it easy, inshallah. So, Sister Bai, I think you should go and read the Quran. Okay, big brother, I'll read it, inshallah. So just give me a minute. Bismillah. I'll just read the English one, big brother, because... No problem. Okay. okay. So, oh, before we jump into that, big brother, because I think everybody's like trying to already as well the camera. Because I'd I like to ask like you on a lighter story. note what is, is your favorite ayah like from, from the Quran? Okay. Uh, you just the rest, inshallah. The favorite ayah of the Quran. So, yeah. I, uh, I've i always had an ayah that whenever this question is posed, it will just come into my mind. But that doesn't mean that this is the favorite ayah. So there are so many ayat in the Quran that can be source of uh, my personal inspiration. But this ayah in particular, uh, perhaps I resonate with so much. And that is, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ I consider this ayah to be the most exhilarating ayat in the Quran in terms of Allah's mercy and forgiveness. It says that, tell them, O Muhammad Sallallahu tell my servants who have transgressed against themselves, who have done the wrong sin day and night, despair not from the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala forgive all sins. Indeed, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the most forgiving, most merciful. Due to the fact, of course, that we are all sinful by default, that we have a lot of ugly history. May Allah protect us all and forgive and erase our, our, our shortcoming and sins. This ayah comes as a sort of comfort that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in advance. Hey, be careful. No matter how major or minor your sins are, I am capable of forgiving and erasing all of them, provided that you come clean and repent completely from what you have done in the past. And I found this ayah to be really um, something that keeps anyone who have done wrong, hopeful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him one day, inshallah, once you do the right thing and repent to him. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Did everybody took note of that? And also, big brother, in relation to what you've just shared also, like I remember that one quote where, uh, I think it was Muslim who said it, that um, the consolation of being a human being is that you have a Lord that is most forgiven. Absolutely. And, and that's that's the, the difference actually between Islam and any other religion. So there are so many religions who told that in order for you to be forgiven, you have to do certain activities or reach out to certain deities or personalities or in order for God to even look into your case. Where in Islam, all what you need to do is to regret what you have done, to make a commitment that you will never do that again. And that's about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely accept your sincerity in asking him to forgive you. And, and this is where we feel really uh, honored to be among the people, uh, uh, the, the nation or the ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan, big brother. Well said. So 
Hi everyone, uh, for your reference, please do go to Ayah 183 of Surah Al-Baqarah in where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, O believers, fasting is prescribed for you as it was for those before you. So perhaps you will become mindful of Allah. And we want to focus here, big brother, on the La'allakum tattakun, right? Which, which means taqwa. Yes. So can you help us understand how actually fasting leads us to developing taqwa and why this results to making our lives easier as mentioned in this ayah. No, no, this is very big. We shouldn't jump into how Ramadan helps us uh, attain taqwa. We have to go back first to uh, the main purpose and objective of the entire month of Ramadan is to achieve taqwa. Not only that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Alif la meem dhalik al kitabu la rayba fi hudan lil muttaqeen that this book, the Quran, is there is no doubt about it. In, in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said that this book, there is no doubt in it, a guidance for the people of taqwa. So remember here, the Quran, its main purpose is to guide the people who have already the qualities of taqwa. And Ramadan as a pillar, as one of the pillars of Islam, was revealed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to the believers in order for them to attain taqwa. Not only that, but the entire Jannah, which you and I yearn for, which you and I dream to attain, ta'ala, was prepared for the people of taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And haste. Allah is talking to us, my brothers, my sisters. Allah is addressing you. Haste. O believers, haste towards forgiveness from your Lord and Jannah, which it's with, is the heavens and the earth. It was prepared for the people of taqwa. Allahu Akbar. So first of all, we have to understand what is this taqwa? What is this concept which the Prophet ﷺ said, it is only observed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is only in the heart. And alhamdulillah, this is another great blessing that we should praise Allah for. That taqwa is something so hidden, it's within our heart. I know it, Allah knows it, no one else knows it. Except myself, I would know that what I'm doing is right or wrong. I will, I will know whether what I have done yesterday is haram or halal. I will recognize that because I know the intent, I know my intention. Although sometimes, you know, the intention gets spoiled, but that's another topic. But the point is, I know what I have done yesterday was right or wrong. Oh, you just recorded now, mashallah, sister. Yeah, mashallah, <laughs> totally forgot, could, big brother. You could, Please forgive you could me. grab, you could grab the recording from the live anyway, inshallah. But the point is that Allah is the only deity who observe your level of taqwa. That's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in the Quran, "Inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum." The most noble amongst you in the sight of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one who has the maximum amount of taqwa in his heart. But what is taqwa? Taqwa basically, my brothers, my sisters in Islam, is to create a barrier between yourself and whatever else that may anger or displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his punishment. Is to apply to the Quran to the best of your ability. This is the definition of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu arda when he was asked about taqwa. Is to be always vigilant about what you do, what you say, what you know, what action is halal and acceptable, and what action are haram and displeasing to Allah. If you are not vigilant in living day in and day out in your life with that mindset, whether what I'm doing is right or wrong, then your taqwa, you're lacking taqwa. Subhanallah. That's the meaning of taqwa. Subhanallah. And to prepare for the day of departure, for death, to be to live in this dunya and work continuously with that mindset as well that one day you're going to go and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how are you planning to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? With plenty of songs and movies and photos, inappropriate imagery on your phone. And, and when you die, people look into your devices and see haram stuff and conversation between the opposite gender. Is that how you want to meet Allah? Or you want to meet Allah with the maximum acts that is pleasing to him? Acts related to your main objective, why he created you, and that is to worship him. This is obviously what how you wanted to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon. And Ramadan is the absolute opportunity for us to achieve taqwa. Look, even children, even little ones, they understand the value of Ramadan. Look, my dear sister, Baya Aisha and everyone, 
I want to ask the sisters in the room, when you are cooking in Ramadan alone, no one is watching you. What is stopping you from actually eating and drinking? What is stopping you? You are alone. You are in the kitchen alone. You are cooking and the food, mashallah, smells delicious. What is stopping you from eating and drinking? The answer is obvious. You, you are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Water, my brothers and sisters in Islam, water, the purest substance on planet earth that Allah created for us, tahur, it's pure in and of itself, is pure. Allah said it's haram in Ramadan from dawn to, sun, to sunset. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to obey me or not? So Ramadan is the practical uh, you know, opportunity for us to prove that we are sincere and we are truly obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our spouses, the halal spouses from dawn to sunset became haram for us. The regular food became haram for us. For us. And that's why Ramadan is the most beloved act of worship in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Hadith Qudsi said that all the acts, all the deeds of, son, of the son of Adam is for him. It's beneficial for you. It will improve your spirituality, your your humanity and so on, except fasting. It is for me and I will reward for it. Meaning the, the reward of fasting sincerely to achieve that concept of taqwa is a surprise on the day of judgment. Allah will reward for it. And the thing that I wanted to also quickly yani, uh, uh, touch on my sister is that uh, taqwa or Ramadan was meant to be a training camp for us to develop taqwa as many taqwa in our heart as possible or as much taqwa as possible so that we can take that reserve of taqwa for the rest of the year. So we shouldn't, and in Sha'ban, we always hear those lectures of prepare yourself for Ramadan, prepare for Ramadan, preparation for Ramadan, conferences about preparing oneself for Ramadan. But rather, I, I believe that Ramadan itself is the month of preparation for the entire year. So we, we prepare ourselves now. The hard work starts a few days ago when Ramadan entered to develop as much taqwa as possible so that when we exit from Ramadan, we have our enemy coming, coming out, shaitan. We have all the, you know, regular lifestyle is going to hit back hard, everyone. And as a result, we, we many a times we slip back and go back to our bad habits the first night after Ramadan, subhanAllah. But the more you develop taqwa in Ramadan, the more you become strong, inshallah, and you develop that strength again against shaitan, against any temptation for the rest of the year. And that makes sense now when you remember the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, six months in advance before Ramadan even enters, oh Allah, prolong my life, extend my life to witness Ramadan. Why? Because I wanted to recharge the battery. I wanted to work very hard to achieve, to, to, to up you know, uh, the, the level of taqwa so I can survive the entire year. And that should be our case until we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. I mean, uh, so Jazakallah, uh, Jazakallah Khairan, big brother, just to uh, stay on the topic of taqwa, uh, because like you've mentioned, right after Ramadan, you know, we might be jumping on again to our ba bad habits. So how do we maintain that taqwa so that, you know, consistently we can have the taqwa in a practical manner if you could say so as also, i mentioned big, big brother yes. there's a misconception that if you are from the people of muttaqin as you have mentioned do you have to be perfect or how do we, how do we you know because sometimes you feel like oh my god i'm not i'm not going to repent anymore because i'm not from the people of muttaqin anyway i don't have taqwa i don't have you know that limiting belief that we give to ourselves so just on the practical side, how do we like maintain our taqwa and how do we, yeah. First of all, as I mentioned, sister, the, the Ramadan is the perfect spiritual training camp for the Muslims to develop that level of taqwa and to enhance it and to make it as strong as anything that you can imagine. All right. So unless you do that in Ramadan, you will not be able to maintain consistency that you're talking about. So all what you have is now. These remaining days, Allah told us in the Quran, Ayyaman ma'dudat. It is just a handful of days that you can count on your, your fingertips. So it will pass and slip away before you even think about improving your life. So it is today is the training. I'll give you an example. You know, when those athletes who play a hard sport like soccer, or when you ask them, how do you maintain fitness? 
how do you how do you stop eating ice cream all the time how how are you not eating samosa like the rest of the you know the world how how are you maintaining this lifestyle which to us from the from our side is boring these people wake up very early in the morning they keep running they lift weight you know what they say they say that training is is meant to be hard the training to prepare you for the match to prepare you for the game it is meant to be daunting it is meant to be painful annoying and not enjoyable ramadan is like that by the way if you said that i'm enjoying ramadan in the sense that mashallah i can't wait to stand 20 raka for two hours to pray you, then you are lying to yourself no it is difficult it is it requires some effort it requires some long breath it requires some encouragement from other people. Otherwise, we start very strong in the first few days of Ramadan. And then again, the curve go, go down. Instead of standing in the masjid, you say, no, I'll go tarawih and you know, I'll pray at home. Instead of 20 rakah, no, I'll, I'll adjust to 4 rakah or 2 rakah. I'll make just dua. A tarawih is not compulsory, you see? So the point is, you have to push your limit in a manner that it hurts. You have to get out of Ramadan. Take that deep breath. Oh, it was difficult, but the result now, the outcome is you have that necessary spiritual fitness that will, will keep you consistent. So that's why we fall short is that people get into Ramadan. They wanted their eyes is on the, the night of the 27th. Once the 27th night is, o is over, you don't see them even in the masjid on the second night. They, they, it's over. I done. I finished the Quran with the Imam. Alhamdulillah. What else do you want me to do? As if Ramadan is the only month we have. As if Allah is the Lord of Ramadan and nothing else. Walayadu billah. So in order for you to maintain consistency after Ramadan, you have to develop that strength today. You have to decide that these actions that I have started the Ramadan, I'm taking it with me throughout the year. Yes, I will reduce the quantity. Instead of reading one juz a day, I will read one page a day. But I will not ever, you know, abandon the Quran for a year until the next Ramadan because I may never live until I witness that next Ramadan. So this is one aspect. The second is taqwa, as I mentioned, is something that we cannot measure. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This number one. Number two, your best is not my best. My best is never going to be your best. So your best is good enough in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do what you can bear. There are people who can stand up all night and pray, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. And there are some people who can cry while raising up their hands in dua. And there are people who can use the Quran and utilize the Quran and memorize the Quran and read it day and night. So see and try to evaluate which act of worship is your most or, or the strongest. And enhance on that and focus on that. And, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will witness your level of taqwa. You don't have to measure anything so long as you are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fulfilling your obligations, that's good enough. Don't ever compare whatever anyone else is doing by what you can do. Because sometimes we can't compete with others, right? So you have to respect your humanity and you have to respect your capability and abilities. And slowly, slowly, of course, you have to improve. So if you read it one page a day today for, of, of the Qur'an, inshallah ta'ala after a month or two, once that one page became part of your existence, meaning it becomes a habit that you cannot quit, then increase a little bit more. Yeah, enhance your abilities, right? And, and this is how things are, are getting done in, you, in, in, in normal, normal circumstances, inshallah. Inshallah. So before you jump onto the second question, Big Brother, I'd yeah. like to make a pledge here with everyone. Is everybody <laughs> here prepared to pledge that inshallah we'll make this Ramadan the best one yet and it's going to be a marathon. So we're all prepared for this Ramadan marathon. It's still on the fourth day or fifth day of Ramadan. So we still have all the uh, remaining days inshallah to make sure that we have that intention that right after Ramadan we're going to be the uh, new version of us inshallah. Amen. So if everybody's okay with that, <laughs> then do comment in the chat section, inshallah, because not everybody's opening their camera, so we would like to know if everybody's just, um, on here. Are they awake? Are they awake? Is and everyone how about awake? Let us the know people... on the chat box, inshallah. Mashallah. And for everyone as well, inshallah, we'll be opening the, uh, the, the floor for Q&A later on as, as we finish, inshallah. So don't worry inshallah. for that. So... Big Brother, as for everyone's reference, please go to uh, still on Surah Al-Baqarah, but this time around on Ayah 208. 
So on this ayah, big brother, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh, you have believed, enter into Islam completely and do not follow the footsteps of Satan or Shaitan. Indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. Allah so, Allah. big brother, a question comes is, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention shaitan's footsteps? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sorry. Yeah. I have to, you know, I'm so already, I'm so passionate already. Mashallah. Okay. Yeah, that's big brother. That's our big brother, Wael, very passionate. So, does this footsteps mean, does it apply that we do, we don't act, if we don't actively work on our iman or strengthening our iman, that we will also gradually lose it over time? Absolutely, you 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 actually understand the the meaning of the ayah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is asking us to enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Don't pick and choose. Don't try to to decorate your Islam. Don't say hijab is hijab of the heart. No, hijab is hijab of everything, as it is described and as it is explained and practiced by the Muslims since day one. Cigarette is haram, brother. Don't try to decorate it and add the word makruh to halalize it and to justify the wrong. Uh, my girlfriend, uh, I can't marry her now. So what do I do? I cut the relationship because that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. What is Pro Prophet Muhammad SAW said. So don't negotiate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is telling us, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. If you want to become a Muslim, this is Islam. You can't add, you can't edit, you can't, you know, uh, decorate it. Because it does not need any addition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already said, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَةِ وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ This day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and chosen Islam to be your religion. Allah completed His favor. Allah singled out Islam to be the only favor that He bestowed on us, despite the fact that His favors are numerous, and we can't even count them. But that means Islam on its own, when it is practiced fully, it encompasses all favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes actually the favor that you will highlight in your life. That's why we say, Alhamdulillah ala ni'matil Islam wa kafa biha ni'ma. All praise due to Allah for the favor of Islam, and it is sufficient as a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So once that is completed, you are protected against our only enemy, our avoid enemy, and that is shaitan. You are protected. But once you start pick and choose, you are opening that door where shaitan will come and fool you. Like Bersi said, the, the priest or the monk, the Prophet ﷺ told us his story. A man who was known and popular about his worship and relationship and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because, who, because he opened doors of shaitan, he was able to commit zina, kill the, the lady that he committed zina with and her child. So he impregnated her and then he killed them both and then he buried them and he lied about them to, to, to the, her brothers. And at the end, he was uh, persecuted and at the persecution before they execute him, he prostrated to shaitan to save him from his trouble. Look at this, from being the one who is well-known worshiper in the community to someone who died in shirk. So, you have to understand that unless you practice Islam to the best of your ability fully and accept whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throw at you, accept it with full acceptance, submission, then shaitan will be playing fast and loose with you. You know, it's like subhanAllah al uh, There is an ayah in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Fala wa rabbika. The ayah starts very strangely. The ayah starts by an oath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, no, by Allah. That's how the ayah started. No, by your Lord, they are not considered complete believers. That's how the ayah started. Until they make you, O Muhammad, the judge between them in matters that they have disputed upon. And they should never feel any distress in their hearts or any annoyance or any disagreement in their hearts about what you have judged the, the matter with. And they should accept that judgment with complete surrender and complete submission. Allah is taking an oath that Unless you do that, unless you accept the judgment, the halal, the haram that Allah has revealed in the Quran and his prophet, unless you accept and fulfill and, and practice to the best of your ability, you are not considered to be a complete believer.
And that's why the moment you allow shaitan to insert these harams into your life, this is where you are broken. Because once you uh, take things easy, and once you mix halal with haram, then the obligations too, the obligations will start being neglected. You will start neglecting your obligatory. So once you, you, you neglect the sunnah prayers, it will be very easy for you to neglect the obligatory pr prayers and so on and so forth. And that's why one of the ayat in the Quran that really puzzled me was the ayah where Ibrahim السلام, was making dua as recorded in the Quran. Oh Allah, make this place, the, the city of Mecca, a place of security and safety. And protect me and my children from worshipping the idols. The same man who broke the idols and destroyed them because he didn't believe that they can harm or benefit, he is the same one asking Allah to protect him from worshipping the same idols. You may, you may wonder and ask why would Ibrahim go out of his way and pray for something that he is already certain he's not going to do it. Because no one is immune and no one is safe from falling into uh, haram activity. And that's why enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Don't even leave a room for doubts. Otherwise, shaitan will attack and shaitan will attack from ways that you don't even expect. And that's why Lata Tabaw Khutwat Shaitan is mentioned. The footsteps of Shaitan is mentioned, not Shaitan himself, because Shaitan will not come and command you to do zina. No, Shaitan will drag your feet one bit at the time until you find yourself, you know, committing something major that you will regret and it will be very difficult for you to make a comeback. May Allah protect us all. I hope that this is clear now, inshallah. Inshallah. Practically, big brother, just touching on that, uh, what you just mentioned. What is the baseline? Like, if there's, because what is the generally baseline for us to protect ourselves from shaitan? Like, number maybe... one, your, your environment should be, your environment should be protected. So, for example, uh, Umar al Khattab, radiallahu anhu, a hadith was reported. He said, As shaitan ma'al wahid wa huwa minal ithnaini abad. Shaitan is with the individual and he is farther away from the two which means always stick to a congregation, always stick to living around people. Don't live by yourself. Don't no, isolate, don't. Yourself, and go. Don't isolate yeah. yourself and go into your bedroom and leave the rest of the family members, you know, uh, having their own world. And of course, once you live by yourself for a couple of hours, shaitan will be there to fill uh, up your schedule and uh, suggest for you what to do and what not to do. And of course, shaitan is not there to suggest anything appropriate, but rather you will find yourself because you are alone, not protected, falling into haram activities. So once your environment is designed in that way, in, in a manner that is conducive to iman-driven activities and goodness and productivity, then you are protecting yourself from shaitan. So this one aspect. Second, the actions in which the Prophet wasallam commanded us to do, whether it is obligatory or optional. These are, you know, the Prophet ﷺ is the selection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only that, but the Prophet ﷺ, his life was a revelation. His entire life was a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our own guidance. Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran that he is our example and that you should take him as a role model? So whether the actions are obligatory or sunnah or optional, it doesn't matter. He does them. The Prophet ﷺ will be followed by the companions and they would be imitating every single action without even understanding the wisdom behind these actions. Why? Because they knew he is sent from high and he is their source of guidance. So follow the Prophet ﷺ to the best of your ability, whether his actions, his uh, words, his advice were obligatory or optional. And you will be safe, protected from the footsteps of shaitan. Thirdly, and the most, I think one of the most important on the top of what we mentioned is having good company in your life that will always drag you and remind you of your obligations and of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his commands upon us. You need those people. You need to tell them, hey, listen, wake me up for Fajr. If you can't wake up for Fajr until today, hey, let's have a schedule together to read the Quran. Wallahi, I feel sorry. Sometimes I go through my WhatsApp groups. You know the groups. We all have these groups, right? And sometimes I just go through the chats that been taking place in those in those groups. And I sometimes, wallahi, nearly cry because these groups can be utilized in a very, very, uh, you know, uh, better manner. You can actually make that group for 
correcting one's recitation. Every day you choose a person to recite few portions of the Quran and some exper expertise, you know, some experts of the Quran recitation and Tajweed can correct those recitation. And then we can benefit. Instead of sending me millions on zillions of flowers during Eid greeting and Ramadan greeting, Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Mubarak, Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs> and just the message is coming the same. 200 people on the same group sending you flowers. Instead of sending you an ayah from the Quran and explaining its meaning. So we have to really grow up, you know, in, in, on all levels and use those groups in our favor. Instead of, uh, instead of having those groups, the name is Islamic groups, but the fact is it's a waste of time groups, really. If you, if you receive 200 messages, everyone is telling you the same thing. Or you make dua in those groups and uh, 200 people say, Ameen, 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 Ameen. <laughs> a tin, I mean, tin, and then you look, I mean, I get distracted, and it 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 pre prevents you from doing what is necessary. See, so I think I think, uh, Yani, try to juggle around what I just mentioned, and you will be all right, inshallah. Yeah, j just uh, on a lighter note, when it comes to groups, the practical tip for that is to make sure they are on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or exit if you find that there are groups even if those people are your friends but if you find that those groups are not benefiting you in any way yani the prophet sallallahu dua is allahumma zuqni ilman nafi'a o oh allah provide me with knowledge that is beneficial so if if those groups are not benefiting you in any way and it becomes just a chill out time then i think you you should exit you should yeah. exit those groups and find other groups that can really benefit you Unless, of course, the group itself was made for fun and it is uh, monitored and it is uh, timed, meaning like, you know, every uh, day maybe we'll spend 30 minutes to have some fun activities or uh, riddles or whatever else. Yeah, fun groups join, but limit them because we were not created to have fun. Just to echo what you said also, Big Brother, uh, I really appreciate when you mentioned about the, uh, about, you know, taking care of our companion, those who drive us to the deen, because nowadays or in these days, it, it's highlighted to, towards individualism, right? So, but yes. our deen is a deen of jama'ah. That's why we are encouraged all the time yeah. to be together because that helps us from, you know, from the footsteps yes. of shaitan. That's why, that's, Jazakallah khairan. That's why Omar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu arda, when he asked some of the companions about what do you wish, one day he was sitting with them and say, what do you wish? So someone say, I wish that this room would be filled with gold and silver so I can donate it for the sake of Allah. And when his turn came, so he was asking several companions, everyone you know, wish to have this room full of something that he can give for the sake of Allah. When uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu arda, his turn came, they asked him, so what do you wish? He said, I wish that this room would be filled with people like Talha ibn Ubaidullah, as Zubair ibn al-Awam, the companions, the people who died, the people who passed away, who were the main reason why Islam was brought to us today. He wished that the, those companions would be around because they were source of energy and motivation and inspiration to others to practice the faith. We need those people in our lives today. Many, you know, I, I you know, as you know, I, I help people to cope with addictions and so on. And this is number one tip I tell them as soon as we talk. Listen, if you live alone, it's not going to happen. I say like this. Today, even today I was talking to a client. I told them, listen, it's never going to work. I can give you a holiday. I can put that program on a break until you find people to live with. Halal, of course. So that you can actually get rid of your addiction. Otherwise, you just get the theory from me, but you are not protected enough to cope with addictions. And addiction is, is severe. And shaitan knows that you're addicted, so it will be double trouble for you, shaitan and your addiction, and you are just living by yourself. So having good company in your midst is one of the most important and helpful tip to survive this uh, the trials of this dunya. Okay, so I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to jump into our last ayah, big brother. Okay. So everyone jump into ayah 139 of Surah Al-Ali Imran, and where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, do not falter or grieve, for you you will have the upper hand if you are true believers. So, Shaykh Wael, would you reckon that this ayah is a comfort from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself? It's not just a comfort from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my dear sister. It is a uh, a message for us to pay heed when things go wrong. When we look at the issue or the situation of our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Gaza, and when we 
uh, feel sad and uh, and angry and, and anxious and so on when you see those images. And of course, there is no no human being who would see these images and feel okay. No one. We are all going through traumatic experience as a result of the imagery that we have seen in the past couple of months. It's it's something that we haven't seen in, in our lifetime. Wallahi, the, 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 the people who are teared apart, literally teared apart, physically teared apart, uh, the father who's carrying his children in, in plastic bags, the remnants of these children. These things that we haven't seen, we haven't seen in many, many in our lifetime, we haven't seen those images. So no one would be okay seeing these images and, and just say, hey, be strong, be okay, be right. But Allah is telling us that so long as you are believers, you will have the upper hand at the end. Yes, feeling sad is natural. Feeling angry is natural. Feeling all those intense emotions that we're going through as a result of what be, what's been happening in, in Palestine is absolutely natural. However, we should take all these intense emotion and direct it in the right way. And that is to support our brothers and sisters in Islam, to remind them, don't ever grieve, don't ever be sad. You will have the upper hand if you are believers, Allah is saying. If you are truly believers, so you have to know now what, what beliefs entail a, a, a person like myself to be considered in that class. And, and our mashayikh taught us what Iman is all about. Iman actually is tasdiqun uh, lisan, is to, to confess your belief with your tongue, to say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, to be proudly confessing your faith everywhere you go. What conviction and a, a conviction in the heart and action by the limbs. That's the definition in a, in a nutshell of what Iman is, is to be proudly saying that you're a Muslim, is to be proudly declaring that there is no God to be worth worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to have that with conviction in, in your heart that this is the true faith, and your true faith will be translated into actions by the limbs, your salah on time. You will not ever delay your salah for a fraction of a second because of any worldly matter, because of a match or a movie or a TV series or a transportation or an event or whatever, or even da'wah. There are some people in the da'wah field, they will forget doing Salat al-Asr because they are doing street da'wah. So yani, we have experienced all of this. We have gone through all these experiences. And this is how shaitan trap us into these problems because he will beautify the haram for us so that we can justify it. So we are doing da'wah. We have a non-Muslim almost going to take shahada. So delay salah. No, we don't delay salah. As salah amud al-deen or amad al-deen. Salah is the backbone of that faith of Islam. Whoever established it has established the entire deen. And whosoever demolished it has demolished the entire deen. So, so long as we are, you know, conscious of this, of being Muslims, and being the slaves of Allah, which is our job, by the way. You alone, we enslave ourselves to Allah. We are ready to fulfill any of your commands. So long as this is our, our main objective in this dunya, then we will, be, we will have the upper hand. Even if we get some knocked, knocked out sessions from time to time. Even if we feel those pains and sadness and grief, and we will have the upper hand. There is no doubt. There should be no doubt in the heart of a believer that we will be victorious sooner or later. So this is what it means. Allah is not just comforting us. Allah is telling us the reality that if you become a true believer, you, you would be sad, yes, but you would be absolutely a source of energy for those people in Palestine to stand up back on their feet and resist you know, for, for a lifetime to come. You, we, we, they need us more than any time else. They need us. In the in, in, in dua, they need us. Yani Ramadan sees the opportunity of Ramadan and make your dua only about Palestine. Wallahi, we should make our dua only about Palestine and Gaza. That's the yani, this is something personal. Yani. Allah, Allah alone knows uh, the, the, the intent of everyone else, but I believe that this is the time for us to use Ramadan to prove it to ourselves that Allah is gonna change the situation in our favor and grant these people victory and dignity that they deserve. We should use it. So this is, this is what it means that don't ever grieve in the sense that losing hope, uh, losing hope altogether. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't ever despair in the mercy of Allah. In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, none despair in the mercy of Allah except those who are disbelievers. You see the connection now? 
So Allah is telling us, don't ever be, go into that space if you are believers. Because if you, if you, if you are true believers, you will use those sadness and emotions and what, what not as energy to change the situation through worshiping Allah, dua, donations, you know, put, pressing governments to do something about it, to stop the massacres, the genocide and what not. This is, this is uh, what, what the ayah is, is telling. Especially in these days, you feel the, the interpretation is, is obvious, actually. Indeed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant this beautiful Ummah of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam victory. Ameen. So, mm -hmm. big brother, because it's already 4.51, are you still okay to um, answer some yes. questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So, so, we have a question from um, the chat box from Sister Denise Diaz, all the way from Malaysia. So, he said, Shaykh, salam alaikum. Is, is it permissible to touch the English translation Quran when you are on period and also the stories of the prophets? Yes, yes, you are allowed to touch the English translation of the Quran and read it and engage with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're allowed to touch the stories. Even there are some scholars regarding the Arabic, they say that you can use chopstick if you want to read the Arabic or gloves and stuff like that. So, yes, you are allowed to use the English if that's your, your concern. So long as you don't disconnect your life from the Quran on a daily basis, that's fine, inshallah. So, uh, also, Big Brother, we want to acknowledge Sister Maria Irish Bulan. He joined the class because he wanted to study uh, about Quran because he just reverted it along with, it, along with her son to Islam. So, welcome to Islam. Mashallah, Mabrook, congratulations. Yeah. So anyone from the participants, inshallah, who would like to open their mic and ask a question relevant to, in in relation to what was mentioned by, uh, discussed by Brother Wild. So I think Sister Fatima, uh, I will ask, I, you're already unmuted, so you can ask your question now, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Sheikh. Um, I wanted to ask, living in a non-Muslim country and our kids going to um, school with all non-Muslim kids, we can, how do you, uh, like, I wanted to know what limitations should we put, like, we cannot just restrict our kids not going out with their friends when all of their, of course, their friends are non-Muslims, so I wanted to know in this a day and age where social media is so strong, everything they can, they have access to everything as parents, how much can we allow them and how much do we restrict them? Um, keeping in view that they don't just retaliate as well. No problem. Uh, of course, we, we are not, uh, uh, we are not told or taught to disconnect ourselves from non-Muslim community or friends. We have non-Muslim friends. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me as a man to marry a, a Christian or a Jewish lady, then how could we disconnect our lives completely from non-Muslims? So uh, this is one thing. Your children and, and, and non-Muslim influence or even Muslims, even Muslim friends and negative influence, it happens also. So it, it, we don't have to focus on non-Muslim or one segment of the society because there are many Muslims who are also, uh, you know, misguided and can misguide your children. So the bottom line is, so long as you are on the top of your game, meaning uh, there is no such thing as privacy between family members. There is no such thing as privacy between parents and children. The rooms must be open. Devices must be in the open. Uh, you shouldn't take any internet devices in your bedroom. I have a right as a parent to go through your phone and check the messages and check who are you talking to and what are what sort of conversation you're having with those people. I don't, uh, if you want to bring your friends here, you, they are most welcome. If you want to go and visit them, you're most welcome. But tell me what's your plan about your salah? What, what are you going to do about your salah? Uh, are you going to pray really or are you going to be shy? Because if you're going to be shy, then you meet in a time where you can, uh, you know, spare the time of the, of the Salah for somewhere else and so on. So, so long as you're following up and establishing those rules, I think there is no any problem. So long as you're doing your very best to monitor their behaviors and, and try to direct them to uh, the deen of Allah and what is essential in their lives, then there is no problem at all. But once you found them being influenced by those friends and introducing new lifestyles that you don't accept in your home, then you have to make a uh, shift. Uh, you have to uh, you have to establish some authority and some big nose 
that uh, perhaps they will uh, reject and uh, rebel and so on. But that's okay because I'm still your parents. I'm still spending on you. I'm still uh, nourishing you to the best of my ability. To, you have to abide by my rules. So long as you are following the religion of Islam and doing the obligations and so on, I'm happy with your friends. I don't have any problem with them. But once I found that your friends are the reasons why you're not praying on time, why you're giving me very, very hard time to wake up in the, in, during Fajr because you're up all night on TikTok and talking to those friends, then I will take a different approach. I will prevent you from having the phones. I will, uh, you know, filter your phones and monitor you and so on and so forth. So I think it's just a strategy that you must introduce to them first and then apply it bit by bit. So don't just from tomorrow now say, Sheikh Wael say so. That's the rule. No, but rather sit with them and tell them, listen, we wanted to regulate those 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 actions and uh, so that we, we, we can all be on the same uh, page. If you want to prevent them from entering or from taking their phones in their bedrooms, you should start by yourself as well as, as a mother, as, a, as, a, as parents. Uh, all our phones will be here from tomorrow morning. We Nobody will take it from tomorrow night. We will leave our phones here in the open outside. We'll charge them and we'll go sleep. No phones in bedrooms from now on and so on. These things you introduce bit by bit, but you be the first to implement them. Okay. Right. I hope that's clear for you, Sister Fatima. Yes. Khairan, big brother. Before we end our online event, Big Brother, do you have any final reminders, inshallah, to our 25 participants? Inshallah. First of all, uh, Sister Zaina here is saying, can I read the Quran from my phone often? Yes. Uh, oh. Your mobile phone? Yes. That's that's fine. You can read it. So long as you read it. Alhamdulillah. Uh, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Arabic. And, okay. Uh, the final word, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember this very, very carefully. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us that our provision is upon him. So he made it obligatory that your money, the wealth that you accumulate, your jobs, your, your health, your wealth, your children, all these things are his provision. Meaning he promised to give, it, to give them to you. He said, that in heaven is your provision. And whatever you have been promised, it's already there. Allah is going to give it to you whether you like it or not. Whether you work very, very hard for it or not. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't work hard. Don't get me wrong. But what I mean is Allah promised that his provision, the provision that he gave us is upon him. It's his obligation. The only thing that he asks us to do is to worship him. The problem with us today, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and this is a good note to end yani, the session with. The problem is that we have swapped that order. We made provisions our first priority, our jobs, our careers, our work, our food, our lunchtime, our this, our that, our movies. Our, we made entertainment. We made, we made everything related to the dunya our first priority. And salah or worshiping Allah, which is the main objective why we were created, it became a secondary priority. It becomes something on the side. So we watch, 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 and the Salah time, someone will remind you, it's it's prayer time. Yeah, we, we can wait for a while. We'll pray later. Aisha still up to midnight. Look at this. Aisha, some people say even Aisha up to Fajr next morning. Don't worry. Let us chill. Let us finish the dunya first, and then we get back to the akhirah. So I advise you, my brothers and sisters in Islam, to change this mindset of yours and mine and everyone else, and remind people that our objective is to worship Allah. So everything comes after that. Anything else is secondary, but the main objective is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill the obligations that he imposed on you. After that, whatever else you want to do within the halal you know, parameter is yours, is, is acceptable. But do not ever make provisions and rizq and work and dunya a priority. You should live in this dunya and, and use it as a vehicle to transport you, inshallah ta'ala, to the hereafter, to Jannah al-Firdaus. May Allah make me and you and everyone, inshallah, among the people of al-Firdaus al-A'la. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakum Allah khair. Ameen. Jazakum Allah khairan, big brother. What a beautiful way to end this online event, which is to always prioritize our deen, inshallah ta'ala. And also, uh, big brother, are you going to go now? <laughs> They have to leave. So, of course, we'd yes. like to thank our our, lec our lecturer and our teacher, Sheikh Wail Ibrahim. Thank you for your time. Uh, and, and also, on that note, we'd like to inform everyone that unfortunately, due to Brother Wild's travel, he won't be able to join us. Uh, he won't 
we won't be able to push through with our class tomorrow, but rest assured that inshallah this will be um rescheduled inshallah and we will keep you updated on our um social media platforms inshallah. So again, Jazakumlaw Khairan Big Brother. We thank all the participants for joining us for this online event. Until the next one, inshallah. Uh, we end this online event with Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika and ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant and astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik Jazakumullah wa khairan and until the next one Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu